I, I've been thinking about something, and I've hinted around at it the last, uh, I don't know, few weeks. And uh, I thought, well, it's time for me to just get to it. So I want to talk to you today, and I want to start out by asking a simple question. What am I building? It's a question for each of us to ask ourselves. I mean, it's something to, that I want to ask myself as well. What am I building? So if you want, turn in your Bibles or your reasonable facsimile there of a Bible. Some of you have electronic stuff. Turn to John chapter 6. Because um, I want to clarify some things concerning what it is that we're supposed to be building. And um, I'm going to simplify some things today. How many, of you like, how many of you like things to be simplified? Yeah, I, I, sometimes we just get caught up in all the stuff. Anybody besides me get caught up in the stuff? There's just a lot of stuff. And the details. Sometimes I think when they say the devil's in the details, it's because a whole lot of that stuff doesn't matter, and that's where the devil resides sometimes. So uh, in John chapter 6, Let's look at verse 32, and I'm going to read a lot of this chapter, but not the whole thing. And I've got a lot of scripture today, so it would be worth your while looking for a pen, something to write some things down with, because you might want to revisit what I'm going to share with you, and um, that might be useful. Uh, So verse 32 of John chapter 6, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. First of all, I just want to stop right there and say, that was just downright irritating when Jesus said that. In case you don't know, they had prided themselves as a nation in the reality that they had lived 40 years in the desert and received bread from heaven. It was a personal or a a thing of pride for their nation. They took it very personally. So Jesus says this, and it's kind of like, wait a minute, what are you trying to say? We don't, we are the only people in the world who do know about the bread from heaven, and now you're telling us we don't know. So it was just a little bit of a, that didn't set with them, I don't think, real well. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now, at this point, I'm not sure they really, you know, knew what he was talking about. I'm pretty sure they didn't. He spoke in parables. And um, we have the beauty of hindsight to look back. But at the time, remember... They're hearing this for the first time and they don't know exactly what to do with what he's saying. Now, Jesus has been ministering, by the way, in this chapter to a huge crowd. A multitude, in fact, it says down in verse 2. And they've been following him around. And, um, you know, he feeds them and does some amazing things, walks on water. um, And then he's now beginning to tell them something that, that sounds a little bit crazy as he begins to really... Tell it, because I've read you this part, but let's just jump a little bit down to verse 52, because now it's going to get a little, a little stickier for the audience. They're listening, but it's getting a little weird because it's kind of sounding like cannibalism. <laughs> verse 52, the Jews therefore quarreled amongst themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say unto you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. All righty then. That is just kind of weird. It's weird enough that a few verses later in verse 60, it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. (laughs) Who can understand it? I bet you they were saying stuff more than that. (laughs) That's a synopsis of what they were saying, but I bet you they had a lot of comments like, oh, boy, he's just done walked off the edge, hadn't he? Woo-hoo, I always thought he was a little crazy. You know, miracle workers are crazy people, and this guy's getting a little nuts now. Hmm. Um, 
And it wasn't only just affecting the multitude or the crowd. I want you to take note in verse 60. Many of his disciples. Now a lot of times we forget that Jesus had many disciples. In one place it says as he was entering the city. When it was uh, the triumphal entry. It says the multitude of the disciples. So there was a big bunch of disciples. And then there were the twelve. And they were the disciples, but they were the disciples who he would name apostles. Um, Verse 61, fascinating. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, well, now listen, you got to understand it's just a metaphor. You all just need to simmer down right now. Everybody just be calm. Stay collected. Don't be running off now. Don't be getting weirded out. You know, you guys just, he didn't say that, did he? He just looked at him and he says, does this offend you? (laughs) Verse 62. He's not making it any easier on them because, you know, they're people on earth. And then he starts talking about heavenly things and they're not ready to get it. And verse 62, he says, what then if you should see the son of man ascend where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my father. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Good word on the comfort zone. God is not trying to make you comfortable. He's trying to make you something better than comfortable. God is not trying to make this easy on us. He's trying to do something good. And how many of you know good and easy are not always exactly the same thing? In fact, sometimes if it's easy, it's probably not good. Hmm. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter I like to call Simon the, um, the, trying to think of that cartoon character. Bart Simpson, you know, no. His dad. Yeah, Homer Simpson, there we go. You know, Homer is like one of these people that's always going, don't, and making mistakes. I've talked about this before, but boy, Peter did a lot of dumb stuff. He would, he would say things with full assurance that he was right only to be proven to be completely not right. Jesus would send him on missions and he would just do the goofiest stuff sometimes. But Peter is an amazing guy. Listen to this. Verse 68. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This guy was into revelation. Not the book of revelation, but the personal revelation. He may not have understood a lot of things. and He may have done some silly things and caught himself doing stupid things, denying Christ and other things. But somehow this guy, this guy saw stuff that some of the others didn't catch on to as quickly or in some cases maybe never quite caught on to. Listen to Matthew's gospel, verse 16 or chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do you men say that I am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, there he is. That's that's who Peter is. He doesn't always get things exactly right. How many of you can identify with Peter? Yeah. Yeah. You know, people like Paul now. Paul Paul was pretty good at getting his ducks in a row. Paul was pretty organized, pretty systematic, you know. And Peter was just that guy, just that guy. I I can identify more with Peter. I really can. And 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 I've said this several times. And and then of all the crazy things, God says, okay, Peter, I'm going to send you to the systematic people, the Jews, And Paul, I'm going to send you to the people who don't have a system of any kind, the Gentiles. 
Sometimes we look at people's gifts and we think we know exactly where they belong and God sends them someplace where we never would have sent them. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So Peter, though he was not the sharpest knife in the drawer, was the one who loved Jesus and his love for Jesus. Now, I know the others did too, but I'm just saying he loved Jesus and his love for Jesus caused him to see things that sometimes others missed or didn't see as quickly. I get emails um, a lot from organizations that um, they're, they're good and they have, they have useful stuff. Um, and a lot of ministries will email me and they'll tell me how to make this church grow. Get a lot of those. Probably one a week, on at least one a week on the average, on how to grow your church. And they have all sorts of ideas and, and a lot of their ideas are very good. I'm not against their ideas at all. But church growth has become a really, 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 really big business. I don't know whether you're aware of that. And, and church growth is a, is a, an industry in and of itself, and there's a conference going on somewhere uh, not that far from here almost every week if I wanted to go to church conference after church conference after church growth conference. Um, but especially as I've, as I've grown in the Lord over the years and watched this church thing, um, I feel like God's adjusted me a little bit. And I think he's actually adjusting not just me, but really the whole country. I, I hear it from other pastors. Um, I remember being a really, really young pastor and, you know, slipping on my suit and going to the clergy meeting down in Athens, Ohio. And I was in my first church down there and I was 24 years old. And I didn't know anything. Proof that God can use the Peters of the world. <laughs> because I didn't know a lot. And um, there were a lot of interesting dynamics back then. I was telling someone the other day. I remember when Pentecostals were definitely the weirdos. And I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit at 14 years old that 90% of the people thought I had lost my marbles or had a demon or both. And a, a lot of the people in my section of the country, southeastern Ohio, which was probably somewhat open uh, to Pentecostal things, you know, country folk, they had some pretty wild little churches down there in the hills. Um, we were, we were maybe more open in that population than other places. And um, most of the clergy back then didn't have much to, to say or much positive to say, I should put it that way, about a, another tongue cocker showing up at their clergy meeting. And most of my friends, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, thought I, I really had lost it. And uh, many of them tried to get me saved. And then I ran into a few Pentecostals and they were glad I finally was saved because, you know, in their book you couldn't be saved until you spoke in tongues. And I knew that wasn't right either. <laughs> Things have changed. I stood right here this week, right in this spot right here and um, prayed with 10 people from, I think, nine different churches. And not one of them thinks that the tongue-talking guy is a nutcase. Not one. Now you say, well, yeah, but they wouldn't have come to pray with you if they thought you were a nutcase. And that's probably true. And I'm sure there's some pastors in town who still think that the gifts ceased and all that stuff. But what I'm saying to you is a lot has changed over the years. And I'm still changing. And how many of you know that's probably a good thing? Yeah, it is. 
I used to, to be a little bit more concerned about numbers. Um, and a lot of these church growth people are all about numbers. Um, bigger crowds. Bigger offerings because you have bigger crowds. And then if your bigger crowds, you know, go to two services, then you look at bigger buildings. And bigger, bigger, bigger. It's just funny because everything I've read to you this morning out of the scripture about Jesus makes it look like he just wasn't overly concerned about crowds. At least not, not right then. His focus wasn't on, well, I better, I better, you know, gather the troops here and make sure that they, you know, that the disciples at least, you know, the disciples, uh, let's pull in the 12 and, and get those other disciples on the periphery and explain to them what I'm saying really and, you know, not freak them out. But he didn't do it. Didn't appear to really be concerned about it. And his crowd shrunk. At least temporarily. Now, a while back I mentioned that Jesus said he would build his church. And I think sometimes we take on this idea that we're supposed to build the church. I would say, to balance it out a little bit, that I'm sure we're supposed to be part of anything that Jesus is doing. I mean, we're co-laboring with Christ. He left us here to be his hands and his feet and his eyes and his ears and to be out there touching people and making a difference. But I think sometimes we do lose a little bit of focus. And I'm wanting to make sure that at least for me, so if nobody else gets, you know, gets anything out of this message today, I'm getting something out of it. Yay me. And if you're like, boy, that was kind of, I don't know if that was really for me. That's all right. That's all right. It was for me. Just be glad the pastor's finally getting it. Finally getting it. But while we're talking about numbers, just listen to these from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 4. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, both multitudes of both men and women and Acts chapter 6 verse 7 and then the Lord the word of the Lord spread and the number of the disciples multiplied kind of cool clearly the early part of the book of Acts put some connection and significance on numbers there was 120 in the upper room before the end of the day they'd gotten 3,000 more who'd come to the Lord and then as you saw it was 5,000 and it keeps adding and keeps adding and keeps adding and it's, it's kind of neat. Jesus was building his church. But what were his disciples doing while he was building his church? Were they attending growth seminars? Were they focused on building the church? Hmm. What, were the, what was their focus? And so I looked again, and I just want to remind you of how they were thinking when the church was really growing. Because if we can think like they thought, then the church will grow naturally, or maybe supernaturally. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and prayers. So continuing daily, verse 46 with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It, it, it is interesting to me that food is involved. Just saying. How many of you like food? Wow. Some of you should be skinnier. So. Well, I mean, there was a lot of them that didn't raise their hands and I thought, well, they don't like food. They, you know, but I wasn't. I wasn't picking on anybody. I'm just saying, if you don't like food, I don't know how you'd be American. I do see something being built in these verses. I see people being built. They were building people. Look at Acts chapter, well, you just write it down probably because I'm going to read it real fast. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35 says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Let me mention something, by the way. Some people think that we're supposed to go off someplace and, you know, 
form a commune and everybody owns everything. It says they did not take the things that they owned as though they owned them. It didn't say they didn't own things. It's good that some of you own things because I need to borrow things. And it's good that I own things because you need to borrow things. But make sure you get them back to the owner. Because God gave them to them, made them the steward over it. But anyway, verse 33, and with some great power... Or with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them. Again, not, they didn't sell the house they were living in. They sold the extra houses and lands that they didn't, you know, weren't productive, weren't necessary. I'm not saying you shouldn't own more than one piece of property, but there are times when the Lord will put it on people's hearts to... You know, you got way more than enough and there's a need over here. So as they saw the need, they sold things. Nor was there anyone among them that lacked for those who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they were distributed to each one as they had need. So this all speaks, if you think about it, this all speaks of a, an amazing level of relationship and connection that the early church had And the growth in numbers was a natural result of the connection that they had to God and to each other. See, God's idea from the beginning was family. And most of us have experienced what it's like to have family that gets disconnected. No fun, right? Well, sometimes if it's that guy, yeah. No. Well, sometimes we... We've had people that left us alone and <sighs> it was almost a relief. But it shouldn't be, should it? And you don't want it to be. I'm just being real here. Some of you come from some families that have had a whole lot of pain and disconnection and problems and, you know, broken this and busted that and everything else. And I get it. But that's what God came to fix was the broken relationships with him and among his family. That's what he's about. I believe the way we build the church with him is by building each other up with him. It's funny because we started this series with Sean Bolts. Bowles. I want to say Bolts. I put a T in it. Bowles. And one of the first things out of the gate that he talked about in the first night was the power of prophecy to connect and make people realize who they are and where they belong. Calling out the destiny of people. Showing them how God wants them to be and who God wants them to be and pulling them into relationship with God. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. It's funny. There's this little word edify in here. And it was used earlier when Jesus said, I will build my church. The word for edify here is the word for build there in the original language. For anybody who's interested, okodomio. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think you cared. Um, literally, okodomio means to build a house. To build a house. It, it, it's amazing for me to think that we are commanded to build each other. I I had a couple of pleasant things this week happen where people said nice things to me and it was very encouraging. By the way, some versions translate okodomia and certain places encourage. Encourage. I got encouraged this week. I got a really nice text message from Julie. It was very encouraging, Julie. And, And, you know, I know that I'm just this massive spiritual giant who doesn't need anything Not. Yeah, no, you laugh. The rest of you should be laughing. She's got it. It's like, 
yeah, that guy needs a lot of help right there. It was encouraging to get a text message like she sent to me. It was very encouraging. It was very edifying. It was very building me up. Building people up. Building the church. There are a lot of things that we can do to build the church. But what if the primary focus of everything we do is to edify, encourage, and build up? Telling people who they are. Calling out who they're really supposed to be. You know, when someone tells me who I'm really supposed to be, I have a tendency to believe that I can do that. When people tell me exactly what I am, uh, yeah, I probably already know that and I'm probably not very happy about it in some cases. Paul tells us something else that I find interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. God will allow you to experience a lot of things. But a big question for you is, are you experiencing the things that are actually building you up? And are you helping others experience the things that are actually building them up? And what's it going to look like if we actually start building each other up all the time? How powerful would we be as a people if our life was about building people? Because I can do a lot of things that are probably okay, or I can do something that really builds. Encouragers are powerful people. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says something interesting too. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Some people will throw tongues out because prophecy is more important. You know, God's not against you being built up. You, you know that, don't you? Paul said, I pray in tongues more than any of you guys. Paul was keeping himself healthy in the spirit. I was praying in the tongues a lot this week. Because I was getting ready for this message. And I just needed to be built up. It's right here. Edify. It's that same word, okodomio again. He who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. He builds his own house. He who prophesies builds the house of others. No reason why we can't do both. We don't always have other people around. So when you're by yourself, you pray in the spirit. When you're with other people, you speak in the spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, that it's valuable and important to pray in the spirit. So nothing wrong with that. But words of encouragement, wow. And I don't know, but when I encourage people and I see that it's really building them up, it makes me feel stronger. Anybody experience that besides me? Yeah, I see lots of heads nodding and lots of hands going up. Exactly. I feel a lot more powerful when I've walked away from somebody and they've been encouraged, especially if there's a prophetic word on it. But you know what? Even if I'm not sure it's prophetic, just encouraging people is powerful. If we really want to help Jesus build his church, then everything we do, we with the idea of building up ourselves and others. Of making people more powerful. Of making people protected. Think about the things that a house does. Anybody glad that there's no place like home? And sometimes you just need to go there. Yeah, because that edifice is that place. Creating home for people. Creating home for people. A, a connection that makes them feel like they're home, like they're safe, like they're loved, like they're warm, like they're getting what they need. First Peter 2, 5. I told you there's a lot of scripture. You also, as living stones, 
are being built up. There's that word again. A spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Sometimes we read the scriptures and because a word like okodomio doesn't stick out because it's translated so many different ways from literally house building to figuratively house building, we don't realize how big a deal it is, but this is a big deal in your Bible. Building, building, putting into other people's lives. As we all grow in him, the church will grow. It's a natural consequence. The number thing that sometimes gets our attention, the number thing that gets our focus, the number thing that we worry about, it bothers us. Pastors are told they should worry about it. They're told, if you have a healthy church, this number of percentage of people will be blah, 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 blah. It's, by the way, why some pastors move. Well, if I'm not getting it done here, I probably need to move on and go someplace else. Do you know that John Wesley himself was the originator of the idea of moving ministries regularly? He believed that if you were around people for more than 18 months, they got to a point where they just didn't hear you anymore. Thanks. That was awesome. The timing on that could not have been better. I just, what? What? I've been here 20 Christmases and it'll be 20 years this year. You guys have been putting up with me for a long time. It's really easy. It's really easy yet. It would have been easy, in fact, at a certain point in the history of the church a few years back. When we got to a certain point, it would have been easy to put myself out there and say, I've been here X number of years, and we've gotten to this point, and it looks like it's about to maybe not be as big as it was, and since numbers are important, I'll move out, let somebody else come in, and I'll go someplace else, because, you know, I'm the hottest thing on the planet right now, because my church is growing. And seriously, that's what they do in some denominational groups. They're like, hey, look at this guy over here. He's got big numbers. Look at all the offerings. Look at all the people. Man, they're going to need to build. But he's not a builder. We'll take this guy over here. He builds buildings. That's what he's known for. We had that happen in the Methodist church I grew up in. Guy, pastor, his last name was Fraser, And he was known for building buildings. So the church got full. And they moved that guy, Reverend Harding, out. And they moved Reverend Fraser in. And we built a new building. Got to make room. And I'm, again, I'm not even completely against all that. All I'm saying is sometimes we get the wrong idea. And if you move pastors all the time, while there may be some benefits as far as numbers go, I have a question. What happens to the relationships? Are we ever, are we ever able to really make deep, long-lasting relationships that are powerful. And by the way, you all know we're connected to kind of the Bethel Redding thing. Part of the reason, a big part of the reason, that that thing is what it is, is because there were relationships between leaders who had been together for decades. And they had trust in each other. And they had a heart for each other. And they had a culture of honor. And I will keep saying it until everybody gets it. The white hot fire of revival will never last very long in the cardboard box of man's ingenuity. It needs a vessel of honor that can hold it. And we can't become vessels of honor instantaneously without learning to honor and love people who we've known long enough to find out what their oopsies are. They're less than perfect. (laughs) Yeah. Except me. 
What? Yeah. I can say that. My wife's not here to point all of my flaws out this morning. She's in the back. Thank you, Jesus. That's why I waited till today. No, just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you guys can help. <laughs> we'll help. Yeah, mama, mama knows. Shh, mom, shh. Mama. Don't tell on me, mama. So with that, talking about all the knowledge that you seem to have, let me just read this verse to you. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. We all know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And that's the thing. A lot of people will make their decisions about what they're going to do, where they're going to go, what relationships they're going to stay in, and they make it here. They make it between their ears. And it's all about other things than loving and building each other up. Love is what builds. If we really want to build anything worth having, and Jesus, by the way, was building something worth having in chapter 6 because he was putting a situation out there where the disciples could look at the masses and look at the numbers and freak out and run or they could follow love. And they chose love. Because love builds up. And the more we learn to love one another, connect to one another, care about one another, be concerned for one another, pray for one another, take somebody to lunch once in a while, have them over to your house for dinner, go visit them where they live, get to know where they live, get, let them know where you live. Well, now we're getting really dangerous here, Pastor. Next thing you know, you'll want us to have all things in common. Real relationships are built on love. So I started out this message by saying, what are you building? But I'm going to end it by changing the question because sometimes that's the problem that we have. We're doing the what. We're doing the what. What are you supposed to do? What is my ministry? What is my gift? What, 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 what? And I suggest maybe we start to learn to refocus and simply say, instead of what am I building, say, who am I building? God's put you in a natural family and there are people there that need built. He's put you in a supernatural family and there are people here that need built. If this isn't your family, if you're listening by Facebook or whatever, found it online after the fact. Understand this. I want people to find their family. And I want them to value their family. And I want them to learn to be long, not be short. How many of you want to be short? I want to be short to the church. I want to be short to the church. We don't even have a word for that, do we? I'm going to be short to the church. I'm going to belong to the church. That's natural. I'm going to be short to the church. That doesn't make any sense. And yet in America, sometimes that's the way it actually works. I want to belong. I want to be a part. You long for relationship. You long for each other. You long to see each other build up. Because you belong to what God's doing. Amen? All right. So, this actually piggybacks on something I preached a while back. Who's your ministry? Identify how you can find someone who you can build. You know, here's the crazy thing. It's a little bit like too easy right now. Did you know that? Hey, Julie, how long did it take you to send that text message to me? Yeah.
God told her to encourage me. She, already, she told God I was already a big shot. I didn't need it. <laughs> God was right. God was right. It was good for me. But here's the point. We, we sent texts back and, and back and forth. And I don't know, what was it? All of, all of three or four minutes. Man, you talk about a powerful three or four minutes. A powerful three or four minutes. It was. I tried to encourage you back a little bit too. Because you heard, you heard God. That was a good thing. That, that was, yeah. It was good. You know, some of you don't text yet, but you still have a phone. Some of you still remember how to use an envelope and a stamp. Remember stamps? You lick them and you put them in the corner of that white thing. <laughs> takes too much time. Well, it does take more time. It does take more time. That's what I'm saying. It's so easy to do what we're called to do today. What if we just made it a goal to find somebody every week for 52 weeks and just edify them? What if we made it a goal every time we went to the restaurant to edify the waitress? To maybe look around and see if there's anybody else that needs edified. What if we made it a goal every time we walk into Walmart or wherever to edify somebody? What if we went to one of those places where the doors don't open by themselves and you have to actually open one? Blasphemy. Blasphemy, yeah. <laughs> I opened the door for some people the other day. I went into McDonald's the other day and I opened the door. This guy's coming. He's way over there in the parking lot. And I just, I got to the door and I just waited, 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 waited. And then I looked over, smiled, and I opened the door for him. And he walked in. He just had a big grin on his face. If I had just gone in, he'd have missed out on the whole grin. And then you know what he did? Because you know how McDonald's is. They got a door here, and then you kind of angle in. There's another door there. And I opened, my, I opened his door, and he walked right in. He grabbed the door and went like this and opened up for me and went. And we're both grinning. This isn't as hard as we think sometimes. So stand up. I'm going to pray over you.